Welcome to Culture on I-24 News. I'm Aviv Grover. Thank you uh, so much for joining me. Today uh, we've prepared uh, what I uh, hope will be a very interesting show for you. We'll take an uh, in-depth look at the fate of the Gurlitt collection, made up of works suspected to have been stolen by the Nazis following the Burns Kunstmuseum's controversial decision to accept it. And on a different note, we'll take a look at the top graphic novels of the year. We begin today by uh, delving into the very complex matter of the Gurlitt collection. Yesterday it was announced that the Bern Kunstmuseum decided to accept the controversial collection that was left to them by Cornelius Gurlitt, who died earlier this year. In a moment we'll hear some expert opinions on the matter, but first here's a reminder of how the whole affair came to light in a story by Sandy Fortis. It all began in the old Munich apartment 1406. 1,300 paintings, drawings and prints were discovered by authorities. Paintings of great value, among them works by Chagall, Matisse and Picasso. Most of the works were stolen by the Nazis during the Second World War. In November 2013, the case was made public. Cornelius Gurlitt, inheritor of these works of art, claimed to be innocent. He stated that he had inherited all the works from his father, a man with close ties to the Third Reich's cultural and artistic circle. The Gurlitt collection sparked debate on the restitution of stolen works. Many of the pieces found in the apartment have been identified, but the origin of 500 of them is still being researched. Hundreds of families from around the world have now submitted appeals and are waiting for a decision that will enable them to recover artworks they believe that they are entitled to. In April 2014, Cornelius Gurlitt made an agreement with the government of Germany to return some of the paintings. On May 6 of 2014, Cornelius Gurlitt died at the age of 81. His will appoints the Museum of Fine Arts in Bern as the inheritor. This is the beginning of a new legal battle. Joining me now over the phone is Alfred Weidinger, the deputy director of the Belvedere Museum of Art in Vienna, from uh, which many pieces were restituted in the past. Mr. Weidinger, thank you uh, for speaking to us. How do you feel about the decision of the Bern Kunst Museum? So, uh, yeah, I'm the vice director from the, the Belvedere in Vienna, and uh, so I'm not quite happy with the, um, with the decision they, they took already. Why, why is that? What do you see as the problem uh, with this decision? No, but the problem is, is um, you know, not, not, not the decision that Bern uh, took right now is accepting the work, seeing them and waiting for claims to come in. This would show a place in this regard. To, because the provenance research is something that needs to be undertaken actively. So you can't leave it to the descendants of the victims to make a claim. So people who may well not have any idea what their parents and grandparents who died in concentration camps, etc., might have owned. So in other words, active provenance research must be conducted from the museum side, and this is the problem. And the provenance research on this scale, with more than 1,000 works of art to investigate, requires many people and a great deal of time and money. I see, of course. So what could happen now? What possible consequence could the, this decision have? So and now what they what they do is just um, they, they they try to seed it out until all the Holocaust victims have died, until no more claims are made, and until everything has been forgotten and consigned to the past. And so nice. this is uh, not a very nice decision. So it's not very serious as well. So just to wait and seed it out, that's not nice. Thank you uh, so much, Mr. Weininger. Let's uh, now turn to uh, Washington, D.C. Joining us from there is uh, Mark Mazurovsky, co-founder of the Holocaust Art Restitution Project. Uh, good morning to you, I should say, and thank you for uh, speaking to us on the matter. It's a pleasure. So, uh, um, Mark, how do you see the decision by, by the museum at Bern? Uh, I think it was rather odd, uh, because um, I don't understand how Mr. Gerlitt actually picked the Bern Museum, out of all museums in Switzerland and uh, actually in other countries. So it does presume that uh, there was a relationship, a pre existing relationship, if you want, uh, between Gerlitt and the Bern Museum, uh, something that no one has really looked into. Um, we know that Gerlitt spent 
a lot of time in Switzerland uh, because uh, Switzerland was his market to which uh, he sold uh, many of his pieces. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many pieces he sold. So um, there are a lot of questions that are going to remain unanswered until somebody looks into them. Right. And what does I just don't think any of this is innocent. So. I see. I see. No, I, I understand what you're uh, uh, saying here. I'm curious, what, what does it mean about the fate of the works? Will the works now, they, they can't be restituted? Uh, well, Swiss law is very uh, strict. It's a civil law system, and it's all about good faith. And uh, with statute of limitations having run out, according to the law regarding uh, historic losses uh, dating back to the Second World War, Switzerland has a really lousy track record in terms of returning anything to uh, the non-Swiss claimants yeah. of, uh, who have been despoiled by the Nazis. So this whole, uh, this whole affair uh, requires actually special considerations, special measures taken by the Swiss uh, government. Uh, it is a cantonal system, so the canton in which Bern is located might have to uh, uh, take some measures to allow uh, works to be returned because, in effect, the museum is based in, uh, in Bern, and therefore there is a sort of a legal administrative uh, pecking order that has to be respected. I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but um, yeah. the, those, are, those have been some of the problems that claimants have run into. Right. Now, and what uh, other... With, uh, yes, uh, sorry, I, I, I was going to ask, what other serious alternatives uh, uh, were there? Um, well, the other alternatives were to, uh, to, to basically deal with the collection itself in Germany without involving uh, the, uh, the Swiss. Uh, right. But this is a failure of the Germans themselves. I mean, they didn't deal with the collection properly from the very beginning. I see. Well, this is obviously a very and complicated case because some of the works were in Germany, some of the works were in, in Vienna, in, in uh, Austria, and there's a Swiss museum involved. Uh, uh, could Correct. you could Correct. you just, um, beyond that, could you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, some of the difficulties in, in this case? Well, the difficulties uh, reside in the fact that um, the collection itself uh, is subject to German law at this point. Uh, now it's in probate, the equivalent probate in the U.S. So it uh, means it's a it's an estate question. So it's a negotiation between the Bavarian authorities, the German authorities, the lawyers representing the estate. And technically speaking, uh, Mr. Gerlitt had title to all the works. Mm. That's the issue. So uh, anything uh, that is supposed to happen with the Gerlitt collection is, it's predicated on moral and ethical considerations since there is no legal framework in which uh, to uh, to return the paintings or the you know any of the objects to claimants uh, right. under German law I mean it's uh, they don't have a system they didn't pass laws to basically allow for restitution just like most other countries in Europe except for Austria yeah I see uh, the uh, the real um, uh, mystery involves the uh, the paintings that were found in uh, Austria. Uh, these are French Impressionist works, from what we understand, and um, these might be the ones that have been most likely to be restituted if uh, the research uh, uh, is done correctly, uh, mm -hmm. because Mr. Gerlitz Sr. Uh, had a habit of uh, shopping in Paris with uh, some of his favorite collectors, and these collectors used to set aside looted uh, Impressionist paintings for him to pick up. So uh, there, if these are the paintings that we think they are, then there's going to be uh, a high correlation of, uh, of paintings to theft I see. and therefore identifiable uh, claimants. And that could go very quickly. All right. Well, but, let's uh, hope for... Again, uh, we're in the hands yes? We're in the hands of the Germans here. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's up to them. Once again. Uh, uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. Mazowski. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Moving on now, uh, still in the world of art, but in uh, quite a different era. Jeff Koontz is uh, headed to Paris now for a big retrospective of his work at the Pompidou Center. Sandy Fotis gives us an overview of this controversial figure. Jeff Koontz is the highest selling artist alive. One of the major artists of contemporary art. But is he really an art master or an imposter? Coming out of the 80s pop art tradition, Jeff Koons often manipulates everyday objects, turning them into works of art. 
1960s vacuum cleaners, electric cookers, inflatable toys, and even children's games. Sometimes his art is flashy, sometimes sexually provocative. Among his more controversial pieces was a painting with his ex-wife, a former porn star, and the exhibition of 17 of his art pieces in the middle of Versailles in 2008. Today he is praised by most critics despite once being their favorite target. However, some critics always remain. The journey that I've had through art up to this time has really been an understanding that through self-acceptance, uh, once you accept yourself, you can go outside and uh, you have the confidence, the desire, uh, out of boredom, really to get outside of yourself. This philosophy has certainly worked for Kunz, who after his exhibition in the New York Whitney Museum, will be honored at the age of 60 at Pompidou Center. The Parisian Institute of Modern and Contemporary Art will be presenting an extensive retrospective of his work. Not only is Kunz a significant artist in the contemporary art world, he is also the most famous and highest selling living artist alive. You know, if I'll hear if some of my works have sold for a large uh, amount of money, you know, I think that, okay, uh, maybe somebody appreciates the work, but that's as far as it goes. Uh, I'm not really involved in that type of dialogue. His orange balloon dog, inspired by children's balloons, sold for 43.6 million last year. The piece was part of a series of different colored balloon dogs created for several collectors. As an artist and businessman, Kunz no longer manufactures his own art. He runs a workshop factory with over 100 employees that create all of the pieces. Whether he's a genius or a media marketing expert, it's up to the audience to decide. Joining me now is uh, Avri Rosen Tzvi, uh, uh, resident uh, uh, geek and everything related, uh, really. Thank um, you. <laughs> correspondent, we're here to uh, talk about. Well, it's that time of the year again. We're uh, we're getting summing to December. Yeah. We're we're starting to summing up, and uh, actually, the Washington Post jumped the gun and uh, summed up the ten best graphic novels of the year. They, of course, uh, gave the caveat that, you know, it's just, you know, a list of recommendations. We're not numbering anything here. And who knows, maybe in the, in the maybe in next the few inter- weeks, yeah, some, some masterpiece is going to come out. But they have some very interesting things on the list. Um, there are a lot of historical stories, a lot of personal stories. We're seeing um, these kind of shift away from, uh, you know, what most people think about comics. We've been seeing it for years, but, but this list really sort of puts an emphasis on, 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 on different things that comics can do. Well, we will start with the uh, Harlem Hellfighters that we're seeing uh, right here. It's by Max Brooks, uh, the man who wrote uh, World War Z. Mm-hmm. And this is a totally different work. This is uh, the story of a uh, regiment, the African-American th- 369th Infantry Regiment okay. during World War One. It's a story that a lot of people don't know. The artwork uh, is incredible. Yeah, and it sort of harkens back, you know, to the old uh, war comics from the 60s and the 70s. Um, we're, we'll move on to Shadow Hero. It's uh, a story uh, also about uh, a superhero, a forgotten superhero from the Thank 40s. God, I, was, I was afraid there, there weren't any superheroes. But on it's the list. also a historical story because it's a forgotten superhero from the 40s, the first Chinese American superhero. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, writer Jin Luan Yang, who is a very successful American Chinese uh, writer, mm-hmm. he's trying to resurrect this, this hero that he found. Um, uh, moving on, we'll move to, can we talk about something more pleasant, which Please. is, no, that's the name of the oh. story. <laughs> it's, it's Rose Chast, who's the New Yorker uh, cartoonist, yeah, very well and this known. is a story about her and her elderly parents. Um, but I really would like to uh, get in there, uh, the book, uh, How to Be Happy, because it's sort of an om- anomaly. It's Did you a- write it? No, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, to answer your questions, I don't know. But it's a very, very beautiful, well-received book. Yeah. It's a book of short stories by a writer, Eleanor Davis. Uh, first of all, it's a woman. We don't have enough women. We just That's had uh, Ross Chast, but we don't have enough women still in comic mm-hmm. books. We have more and more. But um, it's a book uh, that's very literary, very beautiful in the art. As you can see, it's sort of an old-school screen-printed uh, look. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just, uh, it, it evokes a very different feeling than what, than what we see, and it's uh, very well-received. It looks uh, very interesting, and I'm sure you'll read them all and uh, enjoy them a great deal. Uh, let us know which one we should read later okay. on. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Avli. 
Thank you at home for uh, joining us as well. I hope you enjoyed watching our show. Uh, we leave you today with the recent American Music Award winner, Beyonce. The star released a surprise video this weekend to her song, 7-Eleven. It's cute, but uh, personally, I think she could have uh, uh, spent a little more on it. You be the judge.